Hello, Recursive Community. We're filming from Athens today, from Atraktos. My name is Desi Karapchanska. It's very nice to be here with you. And uh, it's also better, would say, to be here with Athena. Our next guest, Athena Polina Dova, combines several unique talent, legal background with business acumen and people skills. So Athena Polina Dova is the co-owner of OWIWI, a digital tool which combines psychological research with game design to help recruit the best talent. Athena is also the Vice President of the Union of the Professional Union of Trainers. She also serves on the board of the directors of the first creative industries cluster in Greece, the Coralia Gamers Cluster. Athena Dova, Polina. Welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really honored for uh, joining your podcast and um, I'm ready for your questions. Okay, I would start with uh, something uh, we read about you and it was extremely interesting. Um, you describe yourself as an introvert, but uh, normally introverts are um, assumed to be shy persons, people that don't go that easily into the startup and into the business. How are you dealing with this skill of yours? Actually, I, yeah, I'm not an introvert. <laughs> uh, but when I was younger, I used to be as a kid uh, very introverted. And I would say not introverted is the real world. It's actually I was expressing myself, um, let's say, differently. I mean that I was not uh, as social as someone would uh, have in mind right now, that I'm extremely social, very open, discussful, and all this stuff. Uh, my environment was actually supporting something like that because um, I grew up in an environment that um, it was kind of more difficult uh, for a kid. So I would say that I used to be more introvert. Now I'm very extrovert and the change happened when I entered the university. Uh, when I left home, I went in another city, I mingled with other people. So I think that uh, my actual nature came um, in the surface. And how you, you, do you deal with uh, that change, that, that actual um, you coming in the startup world today? Uh, I think that uh, I really love it, meaning that uh, it's my nature being more extroverted and talking to people and trying to understand their perspective, their point of view in life and business. And um, to be honest, even if I meet someone for a business perspective, I like to get to know better. Uh, things about him, what is he doing in his personal time, why is he doing that as a business person generally. So I like this perspective a lot, but uh, of course, uh, because I have a co-founder who is a general introvert person, uh, I can see why being so complementary can actually be the ingredient for success. Great, so combination of introverts and extroverts make this world better place. Yes, because the introvert is one dealing with the more internal issues of the team, for example, the extrovert going outside with clients or potential, potential investors. So the combination makes things work very well. Okay, so uh, you studied law, but there was someone special, a professor of yours, that helped you change your mind. How did that conversation go? Yes, exactly. Sometimes one person uh, is enough to make you change your mind. I studied law because I really loved it. Uh, although I think that the academic system in Greece doesn't really help you understand what you want in a younger age. I mean that we don't have school orientation, uh, career or academic orientation. And I think that it's something that's a big issue to be solved the next years. Ideas for potential, uh, you know, entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial yes. ideas, come on. Um, so here for the first time. Yeah, that, <laughs> I think that the academic system as it works in Greece, if you're a very good student, it leads you to very specific paths. So that was the case in my, also in my case, uh, I was um, studying a lot, I had high grades, I entered law school. I really loved law school, meaning uh, that I got the structure of thinking and speech and how you present yourself and your arguments, which is valuable. But uh, then I realized that I always felt that I wanted something different, something more. And I had in mind just being a business lawyer, corporate lawyer. Okay. So I made my applications and I actually was the most confused uh, candidate because I made applications for four different uh, masters. One finance, one business for lawyers, one um, shipping, and one in entrepreneurship. <laughs> you definitely knew what you wanted to become. Definitely <laughs> I had no idea. So I applied for everything. And so a professor uh, indeed uh, called me in his office, and he, he was the vice dean that period. And he was like, okay, 
<laughs> let's spend some time together to discuss your options. So after some time discussing with me and he was asking me very specific questions about me, about what do I like to do, he was like, listen, uh, you are into entrepreneurship and you don't know it. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, it's explained to me because I, I never had in my mind being an entrepreneur, never. Uh, I had in mind uh, career in law, so when after a while I realized that it's not something that cannot be combined, it doesn't mean anything, it's not exclusive, I was like, I really like that. So uh, he told me, listen, a general pathway in, in entrepreneurship, you can choose after that what you want uh, and you can keep the best ingredients. And I remember when I left his office, he was like, you were born for that and you don't know it. I was like, okay. So I, it was very intriguing. So um, that's, that's very interesting, actually, because it, to my mind comes the question of how important is the role of mentors in our lives in order to realize what we're good at? And the second is what parts of schools, professional orientations should schools have or teach the children in order to help them realize where they're good at and what they're good at? In your um, actually, the role of mentors is crucial. And uh, I would say mentors and not coaches because it's a, you know, it's a typical um, thing that uh, people tend to mix up here. Um, mentors, why? Because the mentors are here to make you challenge yourself and think. They're not there to show you the way. Uh, actually, they show you the way and how they did it on their own way, but they don't express how you should do it on your own. And that's the best part of that. A mentor should never tell you, oh, uh, Athena, you should do that. No, it's there to tell you, listen, I did it this way. And he's asking a question. So you make you think, if Athena did it this way, does this way can uh, be adjusted? What's my style? So they help you actually understand your style. Because uh, I think that the scope is not to be all of us uh, one fits all solution. It's each one of us to express his own uh, abilities. Mm -hmm. And regarding schools, um, I have a very recent example. For um, outside of my activities in business, I am dealing with um, a small uh, orphan um, house. Mm -hmm. I, I think I've shared that. So we have uh, 17 uh, girls that they don't have families, and uh, I am doing them the um, career orientation, which is a very difficult you know, audience, of course, more of difficult. Course, a challenging so, one. Exactly. So the way that we're doing it, and I think that this could be a model that uh, could apply also to um, a bigger audience, it's uh, that for every step we challenge to see what are their values, what are their actual abilities and their skills, and what are the, the things that they're really good at, but also the things that they like. So if you have all those and you have a big circle, this is the ideal. For example, someone that is good in math, and um, he likes, she likes drawing. Uh, how someone so artistic with good ability in math connect those two? So we were like, do you know what game design is or UI UX design? And let's discuss about that. Mm -hmm. So a brand new world uh, opens up. So I think that this could be the model to combine a model that would go to schools and say, what are our values, our abilities, and what we love doing. If we explore those three things, and we, we put them along with, let's say, role models. Mm -hmm. Because for me, as a kid, if, if I was a kid right now, the role model is more strong than someone giving them a lecture on what you can do. Because they tend to, you know, feel alike. It, make, it makes a lot of sense. So actually, you're um, helping kids explore the possibilities that, that, that they wouldn't be exposed to otherwise. Exactly. And through this journey, that is personal journey to the children, they realize what they're good at with the help of their role models. And exactly. And uh, you put very, very, those kids uh, are a very difficult audience because they don't have confidence in themselves mm -hmm. because of the backgrounds that they have. And, you know, they don't have the um, support of the family and everything like that. So what you do is you put very, very small tasks that they can achieve them. So they feel the sense of uh, fulfillment that I did it. So, oh, if I did this and next month, I also did that. So through very small milestones, they feel that they have achieved something bigger. So by the end of the day, you tend to tell them after six months, look, at what have you done? And when they realize they feel proud and they can set higher goals. Very nice. Uh, you talked about values and uh, the importance of realizing your values. Which are your core values and how important is it to figure out as an entrepreneur which your values are? Difficult question. <laughs> um, that's very difficult, meaning that uh, it's something that everyone's 
talking about values and everyone is talking about uh, what is your company's values. But when you ask someone what are your personal values, it becomes even more uh, difficult. Uh, I would say that in my case, it's, um, I put very high integrity mm -hmm. because I think that it has to do with everything that we do in our lives. If you have integrity high in your interpersonal relations and you try to be, um, you know, a person that does the right thing when no one is looking, you will also do that in your work. The legal background, you see, <laughs> justice. Uh, so yeah, I would say integrity is one of my core values. Individuality, because I like to support people being uh, who they like, who they want to be without feeling uncomfortable around me. And if I can support that, I would really like to do. And um, I would say authenticity. I, I like this combination of being a good person, being authentic on that and support it with your individual self. Yeah. The, tell me who you are without uh, nobody. See, what would you do without nobody seeing you? Exactly. Even if you have second thoughts, meaning that uh, you are not pretty sure. I mean, and I think that in most of the cases, we're human beings. All of us, we have second thoughts. Um, how did you learn from your experience as a professional trainer, as a vice president also of the International Trainers Organization? This is something very new for me. I mean, I'm four months. Um, I was very surprised because when I went to the conference uh, of the um, commencement of the union, I was just a participant. So after my participation, the president offered me the, um, the position of the vice president because they, they really like how I was moving in around and all these things. So what I represented, I, I, I think. So it's something really new. Um, and the scope of the union is to actually help training community be managed by quality standards. Okay. Because we are in a world that everything has buzzwords, coaching, training, difference, mentoring. So we're trying to separate, set some standards, some boundaries and make trainers, um, you know, better. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience. Um, it's not that big. I'm training the last three years uh, companies uh, and individuals. And I think that the most, uh, the best thing that I've seen until now, it's through an exercise it's called lifeline exercise. Okay. So you take um, a blank paper and uh, uh, just a pen and you're asking the other person to create um, a lifeline by the peaks and the very downs of his life. Okay. So it's a graphic, uh, you know, representation. So it may sound uh, curious in the beginning and weird. And you say, write everything. For example, when I was five years old and I was going to my cottage house with my family, best moment. Uh, when I didn't pass my exams and I failed, worst moment. When I met the love of my life, best. So the scope of the exercise is you understand by the end of that, that your life is peaks and downs and the, the other... Uh, the other side may be a peak or a down, but also you learn things about the other person that you may not know from what were the best moments in his life, what were the worst. So every time that I do this exercise, I realize how much I like it because I see how the interaction of one person changes when they realize about the other person next to them, who is he. So you're a lot about people's person from what I realize. Like it's very important to who is standing in front of you, how he can be the best version of uh, himself. And we're coming here to Owiwi and the gamification process of hiring and finding out the best talents. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yes, I would like to. Um, so Owiwi is um, a platform that uh, what we're doing is we have created an online video game that while the player plays, it takes all your actions and translate them to your psychological profile in terms of uh, your working attributes, meaning that instead of going to a job interview before going there, you have undertook our assessment. So mm -hmm. the HR manager has in front of him a report that says that um, Athena is, a, for example, a person with a high levels of decision making, but very um, low levels of teamwork. So you know exactly what kind of questions to ask this person and not the general questions on, okay, so what are your strongest points? What are your weaknesses? And every, everyone replies, um, I'm passionate. Mm -hmm. So we want to avoid those and we want to go into more detail. And in terms of the candidates, by giving you this piece of information, we make you prepare better for an interview because you go there and you have to present your case properly. Yes, I'm this person, I know how to take decisions, I'm not very good in teamwork, but I'm working towards that. So we make an interaction between those two people more meaningful. 
Perfect. I, I'm kind of guess I'm watching towards that. And that's a question that I guess everyone is having in their life at some point. Is do they, these things, do major characteristics of a person change towards time and evolve? Or they're like stable or a person that is not a good teamwork player will never be as much as he works, no matter what, a good player. Based on, si uh, based on science, character does not change, but uh, soft skills do. Meaning that uh, the character of a person, if for example is an introvert or an extrovert or uh, the basic characteristics, uh, if he has empathy, those characteristic, uh, those character traits are being formulated until you are six years old. It, it's insane. So it's done, no? Yes. If you uh, have no empathy, it's not going to be developed like... Yeah, you can, it's insane how you can see some very small kids and say, this kid has an empathy, he's sharing his toys with other uh, kids and things like that, that uh, they do make sense. So those threats, they don't change, but only if something really, really radical happens in your life, a loss, something extremely insane that it can change you as a person. But in typical terms, soft skills do change because what are soft skills? Are the skills that um, end up from our interaction. So you cannot be born a decision maker. Mm -hmm. How you take decisions being formulated by the person that you meet and the onboarding, the training, the guidance that you're having. So for example, imagine yourself when you were entering the, um, your first job, uh, did you have the same decision-making level with now? No, definitely not. No, because in the beginning you didn't know how to prioritize things, how you, to take quick decisions, risk factor and everything. As you grow, you learn to have different mechanisms or teamwork. You can be a more team player if you are accepting an environment that supports that. So soft skills, the difference is that uh, it can be coachable, it can be trainable, and it's absolutely up to you to make them better, but they can also become worse. We have okay. seen examples of graduates mm -hmm. that they're entering an organization with 85% of decision making and because they were put in a position that they were not taking decisions, uh, after six months when we reassessed them, it was in 65%. So it decreased. Okay. So we should be very careful with uh, the developing of our skills. Who we are uh, dealing with and uh, who we choose to be among, what people do, do you, you choose? Do you believe that is the most major uh, factor of uh, shaping our character and the way we work? Yes, because our interaction is that shapes us. So if you interact with people that uh, they are negative people, they are not positive, people that they are not taking decisions, they are not developing yourself, you will find yourself in a position, if you are the only person in the room that is developing himself, you will be demotivated. And uh, you won't unleash your full potential as if you were in a group of people that they were supporting each other to develop themselves. You're very proud of your co-founders. I am. Of your team. Yes. Talking a lot about them. Would you tell us more about the, exactly that part of like how the differences in your characters has made the OEW what it is today? Uh, the lesson that you've learned from this interaction. Day and night. Me and Elias, my co-founder, I really love him so much. Uh, he's one of the persons that I admire uh, most in the world. And um, I say that because it's really funny because we were not friends uh, when we began the company. In most of the cases you hear stories, we were friends. Yes. In our case, it was completely like a marriage, uh, something like that. It was a gamble because we were... Uh, like an arranged marriage. Arranged marriage, yeah. not, not even, because in that case... <laughs> because you didn't know him in the arranged marriage. Exactly. Um, it was, we were studying together. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we didn't like each other a lot as uh, students. Okay. I didn't like him at all, to be honest. Um, we were a little bit competing each other in our masters, uh, who was uh, better and things like that. So our relationships were not that good until one uh, professor put us together to have an assignment in order to collaborate and learn how to collaborate with people that you don't like in the room. And we were like, no. And um, <laughs> the result of this exam actually was a wee-wee because that's how it was born. Okay. We had to brainstorm together on an, an innovative solution and how in the entrepreneurship class, uh, how we could change things out there uh, with solution. Uh, so we had to monitor an organization, spot on a problem and suggest solutions. So I was working in General Electric back then and uh, Elias uh, in a lactor. And one day we were discussing on like how broken we feel it is the recruitment process. Like they never reply to us when we apply for positions. Yes, of course. If we get a reply, the reply is not thank you, but you were not a good um, culture fit. and. What does it mean? What should I do? How should I improve myself? Help me here. Yes. Or we were um, laughing at the questions that we were receiving in an interview. 
and we were like these things could be different we're in 21st century so the idea was like okay so why don't we change it good so that's how it was born the um, so um, Elias is an introvert person, in contrast to me. He's a, the most quiet person in the room, in contrast to me. Um, and he's a very different uh, school of thought person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he's the most thoughtful one. Let's st- study, see feasibility analysis. I'm like, no, let's do it and see what, how it comes. So uh, the balance is interesting. But I think that by the end of the day, what makes companies work and uh, friendships, collaborations, is that we share the same values. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when we see the same thing, for example, if something happens, we both of us believe that this is fair or unfair. Mm-hmm. So we view the world in the same eyes that what makes things work, I think. Okay, so sharing the same values, but not necessarily liking each other from the beginning is probably a good case <laughs> that is progressive uh, way of thinking. Um, somewhere in a study I, heard, I read less uh, recently, was that exactly uh, the case, I think it was in Blink in the book, um, successful teams are the ones that don't necessarily, necessarily agree, that I'm from very various background, that not necessarily in the beginning like each other, and so they bring all this diversity and not like creating from the same bubble. It's because it doesn't have to do with um, if you like him, but if you admire him, mm-hmm. meaning that when we were competing and we were competitive with each other, it means that we were both admiring each other. So that's why it happened. So, so you wanted to compete because you thought he was good. Yes, of course. I mean, who competes with someone that doesn't feel he's good at? So that's an amazing point. I, I really, if you recall all the times that someone uh, you feel competitive about him, it's because you recognize something to him. Mm-hmm. If not, you're not, you can, don't have the, the essence of uh, being. So it was funny because when I approached Elias and I told him, listen, we had this, we gave the project. Why don't we do it a company? Elias replied to me, I I need five days to decide. Okay. (laughs) And I was like, five, not sleep on it. Do you want to to, to make a business plan? No. He was like, no, I want to think if I can work with you more than two days. That was exactly his response back then. And how, how long is it now that he's working, that we are working together? Seven years. Seven years. So it took him more than five days. <laughs> it took him more than five days. Yeah. Um, tell me about these seven years of like, which is, was the most proud moment and which was the most, if you, you can define it, challenging moment? Uh, proud moment. Someone would say, of course, when we raised our first uh, and the only round of funding, <laughs> the pre <laughs> round of funding. It, I would say it was not the best or the most proud moment. I think that it was a moment that we felt that, oh, things are getting serious. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's happening here. Yeah, you something is happening not. because people are putting their money here. So something you are doing right, or if you're not, you should do something right. So um, okay, I, so it works vice versa. So, you know, it's, it's a peer, it's a pressure. Yeah, because, you know, when we started 2014 to 2016, we had a very different uh, startup journey than the typical uh, companies. 2014 to 2016, we were purely research. We were not commercially active. Uh, both of us, we were working and having in parallel jobs and supporting um, what we were doing. So when we decided that we we're raising, uh, we were commercially active since the end of 2016. Mm-hmm. We raised a small amount to get the prototype. When we raised the amount, we didn't even have, we just had the PowerPoint, a working, not even working prototype. So we had a very small amount, uh, like a milestones investment, just to get the prototype and get the first users. Mm-hmm. And when we get the first uh, users and we validated that this, yes, this, this thing works and it has traction and people that are paying for that, mm-hmm. then we got the bridge round and uh, we went in the market uh, commercially active. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest, I feel like this is a very healthy way to, to go Okay. because it has steps and you prove that you can execute and uh, people trust you on that. The most proud moment, I think it was uh, when after two years having the company, I was in a, comp- I was, uh, in a party. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a party gathering and someone introduced me to a girl and uh, she was like, hey, uh, what are you doing? And I was like, I have a company. We went. She was like, whoa, I got my first job through you. Okay. I was like, what do you mean? And she told me that she had undertook the assessment and she went uh, for the interview and the fact that she's very introvert and she had a report saying what she, she would stay next day and prepare herself and not feel bad with the questions that helped her actually get the job. 
So that moment, I felt that you are doing something that uh, has impact. So I felt really proud that moment. Yes, yeah. yeah. It, it makes total sense. And it makes total sense. And you spoke about twice, like my like proud moment. It was like the first time someone got a job, the first time we got. This is also like with athletes. It's very common in business and in athletes. Like what's happening after your first success? What keeps you going? Because, you know, you feel that, okay, it's going. So what, what is the your secret of like keeping your going and being on the top of the wave and putting new goals in a healthy way. I would say that uh, if you have a business, uh, first of all, if you know why you're doing it, mm -hmm. meaning uh, that you have a mission and a vision on why I'm here every day. I mean, I don't wake up and months pass by. I have a very specific uh, vision to change how things work. Uh, but on the other hand, I feel that if you have a product that actually creates value for someone out there, the product, it's a uh, product like growth. The, the product on its own leads you on where you should go next to make it better, faster, cheaper, different. So I think that only if you have something that actually produces value to someone out there, that's the only incentive to me. Because if, if you have something that doesn't create value, so it's a hit and run, it cannot keep you motivated. It doesn't develop itself the product mm -hmm. or someone else. How do you measure value in a way? Uh, how do we measure? We measure that through very specific KPIs. For example, when uh, in the beginning, that was the biggest difficulty that we had because, okay, you made it too. You had to, per we were 25 and we had to persuade HR directors that they were handling a lot of people to try a game. And you know, when hiring people, it may be from lawsuits to very big pitfalls. So you don't trust easily someone who is not. That's true. Accenture Tech or a very big established firm out there, mm -hmm. uh, especially a startup company. Um, the biggest difficulty that we had is, okay, you took a WeWe. How do you know that it's good? You have to True. pay for the solution, use it to someone, onboard this person, and after one year, go back and see if the results that we had actually given were spot on in this person. And compare with other candidates that came through different uh, Exactly. Ways so of that's why it took us so much to develop a WeWe because the actual uh, KPIs of success, it, it was minimum from six months to, to one year. Because three months, it needs for someone to understand if it's a good or a bad fit. In six months, you're absolutely sure that he's not. In one year, he's starting flourishing. So that were the KPIs. When we saw that the talents that they were onboarded uh, from us, they were 75% more accurate okay. in terms of promotion, turnover rates. They were leaving the companies in, less year, in uh, more years than okay. other uh, people. Uh, this actually means that you're accurate on what you're predicting out there. So you've been around for the last seven years in the uh, human resources, resources uh, sphere and researching and talked about uh, which is the best way to recruit people. And this comes under a bigger sphere, an umbrella of the future of work. Um, and you again said uh, that uh, people, how long they are living. Now we see the pattern of people living in less time, easily. Also the, the, the um, COVID assisted a little bit with that. How would you elaborate? What would you predict for the future of work from your point of view and from your experience? I say that the, the thing that we are reading all around about the big uh, resignation period is absolutely true. Every day I'm listening for a new friend telling me that uh, he left a multinational to join a startup or to open his own venture. So I think that we are a very crucial uh, moment in time. Um, COVID accelerated what we were talking about, the future of work in just one year. It went things booming in one year. I think that the biggest trends right now um, are two or three. First of all, what we call micro learning, that okay. people, they don't have the, um, the attention span to read or study on the typical way to go on typical universities. So micro learning like uh, Udemy, Coursera, small bite of information approachable from anyone and open to anyone. Um, it's the next big thing. So we will see a generation of people not even graduated from typical institutions going in the market. Um, reskilling and upskilling, it's becoming major issues. So I won't enter that much into that. I would say that what I've seen and I perceive as Athena, it's, I think that wellness and um, coaching, mm -hmm. it's going to be the next big thing, meaning that assigning coaches to people inside the companies. Okay. So coaching as a benefit. And third one, I think that everyone is changing with the Web3. 
meaning that people are leaving their jobs to enter DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. So this is going to be the biggest change that we will see in the future, um, I think, right now. Autonomous organizations. Autonomous organizations. De decentralization, democratization of uh, the way we work. Yes. Uh, and here we come from an even bigger umbrella. It's called Greece and the startup ecosystem. I said decentralized, that's why you remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a subconscious uh, taking it from you. Um, the Greek ecosystem seems to be flourishing. That's good news. And we have um, unicorns and soon to be unicorns, many more companies. What do you see there? What else do you need? Do you think that is needed to be unlocked in the country's potential, uh, according to the uh, startup ecosystem? In your opinion, first of all, I agree absolutely that it's the first time in history that we have so many things running, and uh, I tend to say that because every time that someone is asking me, "Is it easy?" Yeah, when we started in 2014, there were no incubators, accelerators. There were just two or three, I think, in whole Greece. And now, if you Google uh, Greece Accelerator Incubator, you will find more than uh, 20 right mm -hmm. now, funds. So it's easier than ever before to start a um, startup. On the other hand, unicorns. And I'm really happy because when we speak today for a unicorn, it means that we started uh, the same period. So I'm happy for people that uh, they also act as role models for all of us on what we can do. Um, I'm really happy that I don't listen anymore the term what we can do to become the Silicon Valley or to become uh, the new Israel. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm tired of that. You, when those places, they became what they became, they became not because they wanted to follow another pattern. It's because there was a need and uh, they solved it their own way. So Greece has also to find its own way on that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're in a very good way, meaning that we're giving benefits. Uh, giving tax breaks is not the only thing that we should focus because everyone is focusing on, on that. But I feel that uh, the general culture of entrepreneurship in schools, mm -hmm. it's going to change a lot of things. And also to showcase a lot of role models because only this is the way to create future uh, innovators, future entrepreneurs, only by showcasing that we embrace also failure, we embrace generally the effort. Failure? What a beautiful word. To be sound, <laughs> <laughs> to be sound, and to be talked yes, about, yes. not to is, be felt. What is said to be eh, sometimes, you know, afterwards, when you look it after like 10 years in projection, you say, yeah, it was not that bad. Um, what, what is about, what's failure for you? Sometimes uh, failure, it's uh, one of the best things that uh, it can happen to you because, yeah, of course, when you feel that, you feel that you are the less capable person in this world alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a bad feeling, of course. Uh, but what we should actually understand, and it took me a lot of years to do that, is that uh, failure in business, it's not failure as a person because generally athletes or entrepreneurs tend to, um, tend to make those things one. So your person, your identity, your business identity tends to become your personal identity. So you don't separate them in your mind. So you tend to say that if I'm successful in uh, what am I doing, I feel successful generally as a person. So if someone removes that uh, title from you, you end up saying, okay, without, what am I without the title of the entrepreneur? So that thing, so I think that uh, failure is a very good uh, boundary, a set of boundaries to make you understand that you can be many more things than uh, your professional title. You can be many more things and uh, extracting one doesn't mean that extracts all the rest of you and your journey and your uh, other small or bigger wins. And saying about many more things, Athena, among many other things many that you other... have created, you're also a woman. How is this going in the tech world? Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, to be honest, I'm uh, very happy that I'm in the tech world and I tend to say that a lot. Uh, of course, it's, it's a male domi dominating uh, world. I mean, it's a man's world uh, it's a man's until world. now. It's a, it's a man world. But it would um, be nothing. <laughs> without, without a woman. Um, okay, to be honest, yeah, I, I'm used on being the only woman uh, in the boardroom sometimes, um, especially when you go in board of directors role or things like that. Uh, I, I was used to, to be the only person in the room that uh, was female. Uh, but now I can see that uh, we have a lot of uh, women trying to enter that, but very few founders. Uh, 
For example, we were trying one time to gather all the female founders in Athens to, do, to go outside for um, a dinner. Okay, how did that go? <laughs> we were like, for how many people is the reservation? And we were like, 10, 8. Really? And we were not when was that? Uh, five years ago. Five years ago, okay. So we were trying, and you should also try to recall what are the female founders that you know are more than 20 in Athens? You... Yep. So, yeah, it's okay. not... Uh, it, so, yes, we see a lot of uh, women entering the tech world, but we don't see many women uh, being founders. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that... It's, Why do you think is uh, that happening? It's natural, uh, meaning that uh, it, we, ha we are evolving. So the fact that the first step is that you enter an organization and you're becoming a tech uh, save person. And the next step is going to be empowered and why I'm not the next one to be a leader. So I think that it, it gets into waves. So some years ago, you know, polytechnic schools or um, software engineer roles were not chosen by women. Now that we see that there's a rise in that. Mm -hmm. So there was a startup in Silicon Valley that they were actually renting female engineers for your startup because they didn't have known. So they were bringing from Europe. <laughs> they were bringing from Europe's female yes. en engineers. Okay, I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, in the, in the near future, it will be, this would be broken like a pattern and uh, more women that can be also vulnerable. You know, we don't need also the women to be on top that to be strong and, uh, you know, also vulnerability, also other characteristics women has can be very, exactly. very, very insightful for a company. And tech give you, give you, I mean, something that people have to understand is that in most of our cases we have in our mind that, uh, for example, if you um, get pregnant and you have to stay outside of work for some months, tech gives you the option not to stay outside of them. You can do whatever you want from every place in the world that you that you want and not stay ahead of things, of course. So I think that tech is a beautiful world that um, it doesn't, you know, it minimizes discrimination and all those inherent biases that we have. Okay, taking, uh, talking about, again still on the Greek startup ecosystem, if I was a girl today and I'm 15 years old, uh, where would you advise me to go and what to do in order to explore the possibility of me becoming an entrepreneur? A startup or, or to get engaged in a work that is tech related somewhere that they don't have tiktok <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. um i would say that uh, nowadays we have some uh, like uh, for example uh, achievement groups like junior achievement uh, club mm -hmm. and things like that so there are a lot of competitions student competitions so, so the first step i would say that take part in student uh, competitions uh, that they're running across um, all the country because it's the best way first of all to work with other people to compete on a healthy way and also to understand how business models work in a very simple format i mean uh, 15 years old you have a gen generic background that you can support that so teaming up with other people from other perspectives background maybe cultures and building something from scratch so giving you the, the happiness of creation and all this stuff mm -hmm. i think that it's the best thing to start from there so no suppressing creativity but uh, showcasing it and just embedding it in the tech world and in this in this uh, exactly M meaning that um, what 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 are the role models right now? I will get back into that. Yes. So what are the things that you admire or uh, what someone that is 15 years old has access to? Mm -hmm. So if you are 15 years old, you have access to the things that you will choose through school or to the things that your uh, family and your environment is going to give you insights to. So if your family um, is giving you insights to become a teacher because you don't want to work three months in summer, uh, so you'll have more free time. And I mean, I'm speaking some stereotypes mm -hmm. of the Greek uh, family that there are common uh, stereotyping things. But if they're open to discuss and explore summer school, summer camps, things that they will make you understand how world uh, works and give you the option of choosing. Give you the option of choosing, that's very important also. You know, I, I was about to ask you and start my question with you were very, very fortunate too, but I'm gonna rephrase it. And I would say you were very brave to listen to two of your uh, teachers. Uh, the first ones to tell you that, that, to tell you that you were good entrepreneurship, that you should do it, that needs a brave step out, out of your comfort zone. And the second one's the teacher that told you that you work with this guy. Even it was the same person. Like it. It, was, it, was it, the was, same. 
<laughs> so you were very fortunate to have this person on your on your way in your life, but also very brave to listen to him, either, even though you probably didn't like or you were afraid of what you were hearing. Uh, what happens when someone doesn't have this person in their life? Which are your your role models that you would, for example, suggest, let's say, in your opinion, a young person in Greece that wants to work in the startup ecosystem and to get involved to follow? Oh, difficult question. Um, because internet is so there, you know, yes. so we see people, we follow people and um, or like probably there are people that for sure have inspired us outside of our 100%, 100%. And I think that uh, to be honest, I feel that uh, the general uh, things that we are receiving from our environment, they're out there. In my case, maybe um, uh, a professor, a teacher, in someone else's case, maybe a friend or uh, their parents' friend. I think that we all have a figure somewhere around us uh, that um, I hope everyone has someone. But I feel that in most of the cases, we don't want to listen. So, uh, first of all, it's what you said, being open to listening and receiving feedback, even if you don't like, for example, the person, this professor that was supporting me to be an entrepreneur and start my own business, I had the worst grades in his class. And I was like, you, you began this hell, you should <laughs> support me on that. So, um, I would say that, uh, it's very difficult what you ask because it's difficult because the internet may be most available than ever before, but at the same time, it's an ocean. You don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. So for each person, it's something different. For example, um, if you feel, first of all, start with the question, what do I really enjoy doing? Let's start from there, because if you're 20, this is a question that even at thirties or forties, it's difficult, but let's start to 15 or 18. What do I really enjoy doing? Mm -hmm. And t tick one box. And then what am I really good at? Can those two be combined? If yes, next step. If not, let's see if I believe that they can be combined somehow. So in my field of um, thing that I really like, who are the people out there? For every person may be different. For someone who likes drawing, maybe an artist. That it's in uh, Onassis uh, stage. For someone that likes uh, running, maybe Milto Stendoglu, the, the athlete. For someone that likes uh, um, crypto, maybe following a you know, YouTube channel like um, uh, John Victory. Okay. John Vlachogianz, that I really admire him a lot. Uh, so I think that first of all, we start with the question what do I really, really like? And not get influenced by what, um, what is sex right now. Don't be followed by what is sex right now and mm -hmm. what's trending. Start with what I really like doing. So I would mm -hmm. say that uh, I would start from there. Uh, I really admire John Kalogerakis. Mm -hmm. I really like uh, because he's a very genuine person that uh, helps people understand their, um, their true values. Um, so I would like to see more content of him. And I also have a lot of people that I really love them and admire them, but they don't release a lot of content. Mm -hmm. And this is a big issue, meaning that valuable people, that they're not out there so you can find them. Releasing content that would be very useful for the society as a whole. Yes. Uh, and here we come to like the, probably my best question stories to ask. My Zodiac? <laughs> oh no, no, sorry. <laughs> I know that, it's great. <laughs> what is your biggest struggle, uh, uh, struggle as a leader? Like your biggest, you believe like disadvantage or something you would improve and to what is your biggest strength? Time management. Is the struggle or the strength? The struggle. Okay. Real, real thing for me. Uh, priori prioritization. I think it's the most difficult part because until uh, very, very recently, I didn't know how to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I was saying yes, 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 yes. And uh, I was saying yes by overestimating my powers and uh, the things that... Uh, I can do. And by the end of the day, I realized that uh, by saying yes and giving my energy to everything, by the end of the day, I didn't have much energy for the things that I really enjoy and are like doing. So I was being in a constant loop of being uh, burnt out, then outside okay. of a burnout, and then again heading to the next burnout. So uh, when I realized that this is very unhealthy, um, I took some steps to, you know, make it better and understand that it's not, it cannot work okay. if you don't have a clear mind and um, if you don't clear up your patient, that it's not a thing working 14 hours per day. It may be, 
you know, this uh, startup culture and thing, hustling all the time, but no, <laughs> Word, it's, it's not no. helpful. No. Pan metron Arison is, uh, yes. is said in Greek, like always try to find like the, the meter, not the uh, two sides. I think all of us, we're struggling uh, nowadays with everything. Uh, and you know what, that thi- I'm really happy to see that that thing with the a lot of hours of working, uh, it's not anymore the standard. I see that it's I'm changing. I'm very happy that the millennials in Gen Z life are think for like less working hours. It's exactly, amazing. Exactly, exactly. And uh, amazing. I'm really happy because they're setting the pace. So the companies are following because mm-hmm. if the talent says, I cannot do it. I, I like to work uh, eight hours and that's, I'm uh, closing my phone after that. So the companies are following the rules. So. Yeah, that's amazing. That's an amazing pattern that you actually see that now the uh, employees are the ones that are starting to define the way we should work and not the corporation. It's like the shareholder, stakeholder capitalism that is uh, being embraced lately. It's 100% candidate driven market nowadays because we have a shortage of talents. So the people that they are actually shaping the job market, uh, are the few people that they are, um, you know, setting the tone right now. And I think that the decentralization that we said, mm-hmm. yeah, if you think about what is DAO, it's a new form of not, it's the, it's trying to combine um, different political views in a more economical term, if you think right. about it. Not capitalistic, but on a higher capitalistic version. Yeah, that's, that's a very nice point. And what about, don't be shy. I am not. About the strength. The strength. I feel it's obvious. I'm speaking a lot. No, um, no, you're not. I, I, I am. Uh, but uh, I told you, a second uh, nature lawyer. I think that uh, my biggest strength is the uh, communication skills that I have, mm-hmm. meaning that um, I like spotting on to people um, the best thing that they can give in a conversation. I know it's a cliche, but it's nice. What does success mean to you? It's not a cliche, it's a difficult one. <laughs> no, it is like always. Um, so uh, what does success mean for me? I would say that um, having a sense of fulfillment mm-hmm. for anything, I mean, that you have done something and uh, having people to share that. Mm-hmm. I, I, it may sound a little bit romantic, but uh, I think that for me, doing something that it's important to someone and having someone to share it with, you, I think that uh, this is the best balance. That's what I would like to have in my life generally. And be happy with what you're doing, genuinely happy. Doing things that matter and sharing them with people to matter to, that matter to me. So I think that's... Here comes the meaning also of a community. You talked about, we talk uh, outside also of the importance of having around us, surrounded us with the people that are really contributing to our well-being, to our development and to challenge us. And uh, how, what about your well-being? How do you rest? How do you recharge when you're feeling overwhelmed with all, from all the f- amazing things you're creating? Uh, how do I, generally, I really, really enjoy uh, going uh, because I'm into extreme sports. So, okay. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, I really enjoy when I organize with my best friend uh, some uh, extreme trips, uh, going surfing or doing things. For example, our last uh, trip was in Georgia. That I didn't know that Georgia has so insane, uh, insane uh, natural monuments. Mm-hmm. So the cave of Prometheus, um, the ancient the cave of Prometheus. So we went canoeing there and uh, mountain climbing and things like that. So I really enjoyed this kind of activities that, you know, you're focused on when you're doing outside of work, you're charging and you're uh, spending some quality time. Mm-hmm. If I have the, um, you know, the time to do it in my everyday life, I have incorporated the waking up very early methodology right now. So. Okay, the 6 a.m. club, huh? No, 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 no never. Not, I, that, I, not that early. Not that early. I think that this uh, 5 a.m. it's only if the baby's crying mm-hmm. in some years from now. <laughs> uh, it's uh, 6.45, so I am doing... Okay, not 6, 6.45. Yeah, it's, because it's 6.45 and it gets 7.15, so it's snoozing. Um, and also having a small routine, meaning the first hour, meaning that I wake up, I do uh, silent meditation five minutes, five minutes I write what should I do in my day, visualization, writing down things. Uh, so from the moment that I started two months ago, incorporated this routine, mm-hmm. meaning that how do I envision my day? By the end of the day, did I did it? Why not? Uh, then it becomes a habit. 
So after becoming a habit, you, you want to be, you know, on track. On you want to be on track. Yes. So how you envision your day? Do you envision the next five years? And if so, how do you envision yourself and OE in five years from now? I started a startup company when we had, uh, after one month, we had captain controls. Then we had the referendum. Then we had the pandemic. Yeah. I don't I know did, how I can I envision I things. Around, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not pretty sure about the next half year, not five. Um, so yes, no, I don't envision myself in five years. To be honest, the, um, it's way too far for me. But in any case, I would like to have my peace of mind uh, doing things that uh, they have impact. A real impact, meaning uh, meeting people that they actually are using my solutions and they're happy with that and uh, they cannot live with that or speak about that. Um, and yeah, in five years from now, okay, I will tell you something that I haven't uh, told to anyone. Okay. Um, because I am writing. Good. Uh, so I'm writing a, a book, so I would like to have finished my first book. That's what I, I would hope. like to. I hope so. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see. That, was a, that would be my best uh, thing in five years, that I would have uh, finished my book. Finished your book. Yes. Can you tell us more about your book or it's a secret? It's, uh, it, it has to do with strategy and uh, companies, but on a more, um, on a more uh, different way that we have seen it until now. Okay, so what you're doing otherwise in a non-different way. So we're all looking forward to... Yes to this book. Um, so we're going to last two questions that are back to the future. Yes. <laughs> so the back is what advice would you give to your to Athena that is eight years old? Um, eight years old, eight years old. Jesus Christ, I was yeah. different and difficult years. Um, I would say not to overcomplicate things so much. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that it cost me a lot is over-engineer things and over-complicate them in my mind. Why and you know being hesitant on things while finally doing them. So I would say that things are very easier than we have them in their minds. And um, I wouldn't say take advantage of any opportunity because I did it. Mm -hmm. I would just don't over-engineer, don't overthink, and state what uh, you actually stand on your grounds and what you believe. Okay, and to the future. What would you like to be remembered for? Ah, I would say that's the reason that I'm writing the book, because I would like to be remembered uh, mm -hmm. for what I've done uh, there and uh, what I've passed from the things that I have in mind. So I would like to be remembered as a person that um, actually contributed to something and uh, left its mark. So I think that everything that I'm doing in this life has to do with I want to leave my mark and I want to be remembered for that. So I would really like to do it through my company and my, well, my book. Great. Leave this world a slightly better place, as we all are. Do. Let's leave it generally as a place. Yes, <laughs> Let's not destroy it. Let's start from that. <laughs> that was a good starting yes. point. Athena, thank you so much for today. Thank it was amazing sharing uh, and uh, listening to your experience and your um, journey. Thank you for your questions. They were very different, insightful and interesting. And uh, we hope to see you soon again. Thank you so much. Keep go uh, going the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. In the next episode of the Recursive Podcast, we welcome Martin Vechev, the architect of the Institute for Computer Science, Artificial Intelligence and Technology in Sofia. I don't have to do much because, um, again, by analogy, you know, you look at MIT, you look at ETH, you look at Stanford, you look at those, you look at Technion in Israel, you look at those places, and you ask yourself, do you want to have something like that here in Eastern Europe in Sofia? Because there's nothing like it, uh, not even close. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and people say, yeah, you know, they're, they're intelligent people, they're smart people, they're familiar with the landscape. So, you know, this is amazing. We want to have something like that. Well, inside, the goal of inside is to be something like this. Mm -hmm. So, would you like to help this cause? And they are. They say, yes, I want to help this school. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's, it's more than that, because uh, by the time I met them, I had already, uh, I had already, um, we had already worked on it for a few years, like with the ratification, with the government, with the commitment from the government, the hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. uh, from the big tech outside. So there was already a lot of basis. It was not just, hey, you know, it is a, it's a high level idea. There were a lot of work had been done. And probably also they see in me somebody who knows what they're talking about. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you identified again. Um, 
And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.